going to read a long passage, uh, Luke 9, verses 18 to 45. So beginning at Luke 9, 18, and it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do the people say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, but others, that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Some eight days after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mount, mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, I guess they'd waked up when something like this happened. It says, when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as these were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is really good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. And while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. And a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth, and only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And they were amazed at the greatness of God. But while everyone was marveling at what he was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this statement. Now, I've shared with you that I haven't done it in every sermon, but when we first began Luke, I felt that as we go through this book, I'd like to look at it through a telescope rather than a microscope. How many sermons could be taken out of the passage that I've just read? Well, at least four. I mean, even, even if you just divided them into the major events that took place, 
but really much more than that because each of these events could spread themselves over several sermons as we really delved into what they teach. But I want you to remember what I've shared with you from the beginning. Luke's emphasis about Christ is his humanity. Luke was a doctor. Luke uh, said from the very beginning, I want to set things in order. Uh, if you're looking for the order of how things happened in Jesus' ministry, Luke is the gospel to look at as the primary text. The others, they were just telling you things that happened, but Luke said, I'm going to set them in order. And so there's something very significant about the order in this passage. But Luke spoke to Christ's humanity, and in speaking to Christ's humanity, he speaks to our humanity. So Luke emphasizes Christ's humanity. Lucas enfatiza la humanidad de Cristo. And Luke speaks to our humanity. Lucas habla de nuestra humanidad. How many humans here today? Go ahead and just put up your hands just so that we can be sure. Um, some of the people here did not put up their hands. I don't know what to do with that. Um, but we're human beings. What do we normally mean when we say, I'm only human? We made a mistake. We made a mistake, and usually we're making an excuse for our own weakness. Today I want to talk about our strength and our weakness. Nuestra fuerza y nuestra debilidad. And I want to begin with our strength. I want to start on a positive note. Because this is where this passage begins. I believe it is important. I, we talked about the irreducible minimum in our Sunday school today. Here is the irreducible minimum. Here is the thing that I want you to go out with today. And it's the exact same thing that I had last week. Do you remember last week we talked about the feeding of the 5,000? And what are we to do? We are to go back and forth. We're to go to the master first and receive from him. Start your day with Jesus. Take whatever time works your best. If you want to be Jewish about it, start your day the night before. Uh, go to God. Go to the Lord and receive from him. And then go to people and minister. That's what we're called to do regardless of what our job is. Regardless, as Christians. If you are a Christian before whatever else you do, then whatever else you do, you do it with the attitude of ministry. I am a representative of Jesus Christ. Oh, that was a good place for an amen. I am a re representative of Jesus Christ. Amen. Wherever I go. And so I need to go, but as we go and we minister, we become depleted. So what do we do? We go back to Him. Because He is the source in the story, he was the source of the bread and fish. The bread in Scripture representing what we need for our own sustenance. The fish representing our ministry to others. He is the source of what we need for ourselves and for what we need for everybody else. And so we need to go back to him and we go back and forth because he is the source. And he is our strength. That's our first, our first point. Our strength is who he is. Nuestra fuerza es quien el es. Our strength is who he is. I've told you before, I want to uh, write a book called Stupid Faith. And just coming over here today, I heard on the radio someone talking about these little plaques that you see all over the place. Believe. Believe. We have turned it into an idea where believing is an end in itself. Believing is the most stupid thing you can do. If the sort or if the object of your belief is not true. What a man that I've, I've got to hurry and write my book, or else it would be too old to use him as, as an example. Does everybody who remember who Bernie Madoff was? He's the guy who made off with everybody's millions of dollars. Isn't it odd that he had a name like that? And people trusted him. It was a Ponzi scheme. They saw little bits of money coming their way, and so they were convinced 
that their money that they had invested with this man was earning all kinds of money, but it was a scheme, and he had made off with their money. They believed. Belief is not either good or bad intrinsically. It's either good or bad based on what the object of your belief is. Our belief has to be squarely upon Jesus Christ and who he is. And that's why Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And they have all of these different answers. This could easily be a sermon in itself, couldn't it? Here's the irre irreducible minimum I want you to take from it. He said, who do you say that I am? And what did Peter say? He said, you're the Christ of God. What's the other word? If we were using the Jewish term, what could he have said? Messiah. You're the Messiah of God. Or if we wanted to translate it. See, there are words in the Bible that were not translated because they were looked at as, as holy words. If you wanted to translate it, you are the Savior. anointed of God. Savior because he is the anointed of God. I appreciate you speaking up. I, when I ask a question, it's for a purpose. I, I, I've actually preached on this. I've talked about how the word Christ and Messiah means anointed. And I said when someone is anointed, rhyming in English, they were also appointed. When someone, who were some of the people who were anointed back in those days? Kings. Kings. Kings were anointed. You remember the story in the Old Testament of Samuel going to anoint a shepherd boy to be the next king of Israel. He was anointed because he was appointed. He had a job to do for God. He was, uh, who else did they anoint? Priests. Priests. They anointed the priests, and after they were anointed, they were expected, they were appointed to go and do the work of a priest. Jesus was the anointed one of God. He was anointed of God. He is the Messiah of God. El es el Messias de Dios. Messias. Now, how am I saying that, Diana? Right. Messias de Dios. He's the Messiah, but you need to understand what that means. He's the anointed one. Ungido. He was anointed and appointed, first of all, to do what? You're all followers of Jesus. He came into the world to seek and to save. save the lost. He was anointed to save as the Messiah of God. He was anointed to save. But as the Messiah of God, he is also anointed to correct. He is anointed to save para salvar. He is anointed to correct para corregir. What do you mean correct? What's the other word we usually use? for that. When God corrects something, what do we call it? Discipline. That's one word. I'm looking for a J word. Judgment. He comes in judgment. Isn't it amazing to you that people who don't believe in God criticize Him for every single thing He does, regardless of what direction you come from? What kind of a God would allow evil in the world? Has anybody ever heard that? I've heard it a million times. What kind of a God would allow evil in a world? Why is there evil in the world? Now granted, I know there's natural things happening out there. There's hurricanes, there's earthquakes. But what is most of the evil? I've lived through some earthquakes, and actually it was kind of cool. You know, in, America, in California, I know, please forgive me, if you've had anybody who was hurt in an earthquake or lost stuff in an earthquake, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but I was standing working on a song on my keyboard one day, and in my church in Patterson, and that was when the big earthquake that brought down the bridges over in San Francisco happened, all of a sudden, my keyboard started going like this. And I thought, ooh, I'm busy. Then the building started to groan, and I realized what was happening. And so I ran out the door. They say you're not supposed to do that, but I ran out. We had a big open space on the lawn, and as I stood on the lawn, I heard two guys up, the street say, whoa, this is bad. And it was just kind of exciting. This was the first time that I had actually seen. Have you seen the, the ground make waves? It was, it was really kind of exciting. You know? That's my experience with acts of God that some people talk about as, ju or as, uh, as judgment of evil. Okay? 
The Bible doesn't say that hurricanes and earthquakes are judgments of evil. That's, it's the result of evil. The whole creation is affected because of sin in the world. But I want to tell you, I have never personally suffered personal harm because of evil in nature. I have experienced harm because of evil in people. Anybody else? Or we could say people sometimes have experienced harm because of evil in us. Now I don't think, you know, I'm sure that there would be other people who would argue with this, but I've, I've really searched my soul many times and I don't think that there are people who could say they honestly have suffered harm because of evil in me outside my household. Do you know the people that I've hurt most are the people that I love the most and I'm nearest to? I mean, I don't think, I don't know, maybe somebody here, has anybody here ever seen me just lose my temper? My wife has. My kids have. Have I ever said anything hurtful to anyone here? I don't think so that I'm aware of. If I ever have, please tell me and I'll apologize for it. But I've said hurtful things to the people that I love the most. There's evil in the world. And you know why God allows that? Because he makes me free. Because he makes you free. He gives us the choice and we make the wrong choices. And yet it meant something to God to give us the freedom to love him. I am thankful for my family. My family has hurt me and I've hurt my family, but I'm so thankful that God allowed me to have my family. Whether it be my family coming into this world or my family going out of this world, the fact is that I have not been everything that I want to be to you as a pastor, but I am so thankful that God has given us to each other and God gives us to each other even though he knows we will fail. And he gives us freedom even though he knows we'll do the wrong thing. And yet people will say, what kind of a God allows evil in the world? Let me tell you, a loving God a loving God who wants you to be free, who wants you to have the choice. Even to the point of where you want to spend eternity. I heard this week a saying that I've heard a hundred times before. There are two kinds of people in this world. There are people who say to God, thy will be done. And there are people who God says to them, thy will be done. One group spends eternity with God. The other group spends eternity away from God. Nobody goes to hell except those who have chosen because they've rejected a God who loves us enough to give us the choice. And yet on the other side of the issue, how could a loving God judge? Have you ever heard that one? I mean, you've got to do one or the other. You've got to do one thing. On the one hand, people are mad at God because he doesn't judge evil faster, even before it exists. On the other side, people are mad at God because he does judge. And why does God judge evil? Because he's a loving God. Because as I've said before, if heaven were a place where evil were allowed, just think. Now, granted, I mean, people always want to come to the middle ground, but evil is evil. Just think. Just think, what, it would, what would it be like to be in a place for eternity where a Hitler, where an Osama bin Laden, where a Mussolini, and just name the great evil people of our history. What would it be like to be in a place for eternity where those kinds of people ran the show. Now, I don't think that they're going to be running the show. I think that they're going to be under God's judgment throughout eternity. But I'm just saying, what would eternity be like if God did not judge evil? He judges evil because he's a loving God. I want to be in a place called heaven where the other people who are there are people who have decided, I don't want to have anything to do with evil anymore. 
I want, a, I want to be surrendered to God. I want to serve Him and I want to love Him. And I want to love people. And so it is a loving God that is anointed to save as an act of grace and to judge as an act, once again, of grace. Really? And what do these two jobs of the anointed one, the Messiah, represent? His first coming and his second coming. His first coming and his second coming. He came to save and he came to judge. And he is the one with all authority. He is the one. As we've gone through Luke, we saw that. He has authority over the natural. He has authority over the spiritual. He has authority over sickness. He has authority over death, the temporal and the eternal. He is the one that we go back to, to be equipped to minister. He is our strength. Our strength is who He is. That's the first point of this passage. But because Luke deals with our humanity, he moves from our strength to our weakness. Verses 22 to 27. Saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must first what? Deny, Deny, himself. Deny himself. Second, what? Take up his... All right, let's say this together. Number one, deny himself. Say that with me. Deny himself. Number two, take up his cross. Take up his cross. Number three, follow me, he says. Follow me. I like number three. Maggie, huh? Number three, that sounds good. Lord, just let me follow you. I just want to follow you. Why does he say number one and two? I don't like that. <gasps> Did you ever hear a pastor say he doesn't like something in the Bible? Let me just ask you, how many of you like to deny yourself? How many of you like to take up your cross? I don't like that. And I'll just be honest with you, this verse makes me really, really uncomfortable. I have said to the Lord, Lord, I don't know how to deny myself. I am myself. How do you be in yourself and deny yourself? You can get really confused. You can get really confused. How do you deny yourself? I've seen comedies on TV about people who say, I'm going to just live a totally sacrificial lifestyle. And then they do something nice for somebody. Oh, that made me feel good. Oh, wait a second. I'm not supposed to feel good. I'm supposed to be living a sacrificial lifestyle. How do you deny yourself? Let me just share with you what I believe our first weakness is. Nuestra debilidad. We don't want to suffer. No queremos, uh, excuse me, queremos sufrir. Now that, does that sound backwards? That's a weakness. We don't want to suffer. How many of you want to suffer? Does God want us to want to suffer? I don't think so. I don't think that we're supposed to go out there and try to find ways of suffering. In fact, that almost sounds ridiculous, but yet throughout history there are many Christians who have felt that that was the way to godliness. You've heard of people flailing themselves, taking a whip and whipping themselves. We call that, what, S&M today? I mean, that now it has a sexual connotation or something. And the fact is, it was no more godly back when Christians were doing it beating themselves, thinking that that's what it was all about. But see, what Jesus said is, look at the verse again, verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected. The Son of Man must suffer many things. What if the, the third thing that he said, deny yourself, that's unpopular, take up your cross, that doesn't sound good, but following Jesus, I really want to follow Jesus. If I'm going to follow Jesus, then I am going to go... Brother Gene, would you help me? 
tell me you're one of the deacons, just stand right here. Follow me. Don't follow me. You can stand here. Okay. <laughs> I did what he said, right? And now, actually, that was a really good illustration. <laughs> I'm not going to go into it, though. But follow me. Now follow me. Okay. We're going to go a little bit faster. Follow me. If I am going to follow Jesus, I am going to go where he goes. Where did he go? He went to the cross. Thank you very much. I appreciate your help. No, you're you said, I stand. <laughs> I followed orders. Stand. You did really good. Let's hear it for Gene. All right. Let me try this again. If I am going to follow Jesus, I am going to go where he goes. Can I just ask you, in this fallen world, where sin dominates most people's lives, can I truly follow Jesus and not suffer? Now, stop and think about it. Just living in this world produces some suffering, doesn't it? There's suffering that we experience that lost people experience. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, in a positive way, the Bible says the sun, God sends the sun on the good and the bad. And when a hurricane goes through town, sometimes it destroys a church. Have you ever heard, you know, this hurricane goes through town and totally destroyed First Southern Baptist Church or whatever? And you think, oh, why? Because we live in this world. A Christian who loves God and serves God. Here's to the doctor, say the C word. Some of you have heard that. You've experienced that. You've gone through it. And it's just natural. Some, sometimes we don't want to admit it, and maybe some people don't experience it. But frankly, it's just natural for a Christian to say, Lord, I'm trying to serve you. Why would I experience this? Why? Because we live in this world, and this world is fallen. This is something that is being taught wrongly in so many pulpits and broadcast on TV as though God has determined to completely insulate us from all the evil that's in the world when Jesus said, I must go and suffer and be put to death. And if we follow him, that means we will go where he goes. And if he went to the cross, now listen, that means I go to the cross. Pastor, you're saying you're going to be crucified? I'm saying what Jesus said in the very next verse. Look at what it says. The Son of Man must suffer many things. Look at verse 23. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I want you to notice that what we listed as third is really fourth because it was first also. He didn't say three things here. He said the first thing that envelops them all. If you're going to come after me, what is that? That's following Jesus. In other words, if between the bookends, following Jesus, that's the goal of my life. Following Jesus, that's what I want to ultimately accomplish. In between, there's going to be denying of self, and there's going to be a cross. There's going to be a cross. Why? Because we go out and find it? No. It was Martin Luther who actually said, a Christian does not have to go out and search for his cross. It will find you. What do we do? We follow Jesus. We follow Jesus. But in the process of that following, there are times that self rises up and says, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Our weakness, we don't want to suffer. But suffering happens in a world where there is evil. El, el sufrimiento ocurre in un mundo donde existe el mal. Especially when you live 
for good, especialmente cuando se vive por el bien. Romans 8, verses 16 through 18. Listen to what it says. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Don't you just love that? Let's just put a period right there. Is there a period right there? There's a comma. If indeed we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now that last verse, verse 18, I quote to families all the time. As a chaplain, I walk into the room and oftentimes the person has just died or is very close to death. I'm on call this weekend. I can get a call anytime. Maybe there's a phone call on my, my phone in my car right now that I'll call back and maybe someone has died and I'll walk into the room and so often I have so few people that claim that they're not followers of Christ and I have so many that say I'm a follower of Christ but there has been no evidence of that in their lives for decades and I'm just going to tell you I've struggled with this I don't pronounce any judgment on people I pronounce God's word I try to speak the truth in love I'm not going to tell anybody that they're not saved but I am going to tell people the only way to be saved is through faith in Christ Amen. And I will quote this verse, and I will say, if so-and-so has trusted Jesus, then you need to remember the Word of God says the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared to the glory to be revealed to us. And if they're a Christian, they have gone on to God's glory, and you are left here to suffer the sorrow of the lost. But actually, that's not the context of this verse specifically. It applies but the context of this verse is the suffering that comes specifically because of following Jesus. Look at it again. It says that it's talking about the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That sounds wonderful. And if, if uh, children of God, then we're heirs with Christ. That sounds wonderful. But if we truly are that in this world that is fallen, we're going to suffer with Him. We're going to suffer with him. I don't want to suffer. That's my weakness. I'm going to ask you to substitute another word in just a moment for suffering. But I want you to move on with me as we go through verses 28 to 36. There's another principle here. Now, Pastor, how in the world are you going to take a wonderful story like the Transfiguration and turn that into something negative? I mean, the transfiguration, how much more of a glorious situation could you imagine? I mean, going up on the mountaintop, and we actually talk about mountaintop experiences, don't we? Can you in your life go back and name some of the mountaintop experiences? Every single one of them are times that we experience joy and, and excitement and enthusiasm, and we would say, man, I felt God's presence. You cannot feel God's presence without sensing that it's a mountaintop experience. Well, what in the world would you take and turn negative about that? Peter. Am I going to criticize Peter? No. I am going to say that Peter was one of the greatest apostles for illustrating our weaknesses. He was great. Because we want to stay on the mountaintop. Podemos permanecer en la cima de la montaña. We want to stay. Don't you love that passage? Peter starts talking. And God brings a cloud over the place and says, This is my son. Listen to him. Listen. There's an implied phrase there. Shut your mouth. Stop talking. Some of you are praying, Lord, help him to listen to himself. <laughs> the thing is, Peter wanted to stay on the mountaintop, and we want that so bad. Don't you just, don't you, when your life is going well, don't you just want to stay there? Lord, can't I just stay right here for a little while? There are times when good outshines evil. 
Hay momentos el bien eclipsa el mal. They are not permanent in this world. No son permanentes en este mundo. Does anybody want to argue with me? This is just a fact. It's a fact that the mountaintop experiences are not permanent. The weakness is that we want them to be. We want them so bad to be. And why is that a weakness? It's a natural human thing. Am I picking on anybody because that's our natural feeling? No, this is just part of what it is to be human. We don't want to suffer. We do want the mountaintop experiences to go on and on. But because that's not the real experience in this world, it's a weakness. Now, there's all kinds of things that we could take from the Transfiguration and preach on it. I could have a six-week series on the Transfiguration. But here's what I want you to take away from it, is that we're just like Peter. We want the mountaintop experiences to go on and on. But the problem is, it's just like, how many times have you gone into work on Monday and somebody says, how was your weekend? And what do we say? Not long enough. Why do we say that? We want the weekends to last forever. Here's number three, or C in your notes. Verses 37 to 43 tells the story of this man whose son is demon-possessed. And again, we could preach all kinds of sermons from that, but I just want to go towards the end. And here's another very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable verse. Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. What is he talking about? Now, I bet you could probably find ten different interpretations of what Jesus is talking about. But I think, here's the one that applies, and here's the one I want to share with you. He is saying to me, I'm unbelieving and perverted. Now, we have a certain understanding of that word perversion. It usually has a sexual connotation. That's not what I'm talking about. It just to be perverted means that something's not the way it's supposed to be. Can I just share with you? I'm not the way I'm supposed to be. I try to be. Sometimes I am, but I'm not always. And the fact is that the way I'm supposed to be is always trusting God implicitly. And what Jesus says right here is that you're unbelieving. He's talking. Some would say, well, is he talking to the Father? Or is he talking to the disciples? I think he's talking to the disciples. Hasn't he just earlier, didn't we talk a week or two ago about how he gave them authority over the demons? Didn't he do that? Is there any verse that we read where he took it back from them? Some people say, well, none of these supernatural things ever happen except in the apostolic generation. They were the apostolic generation, so you can't even use that argument. God is still in authority over all things. God can still supernaturally heal, as I've shared with you. I don't think that's his plan to do that every time. But we need to ask God believing, understanding who he is and what he can do. And the fact is, I don't always have the kind of faith that I should have. And you don't either. Do you know why that is? Everybody say it with me. I'm only human. <laughs> That's an excuse, but it's the truth, too. And just because we currently do not always have the faith that we should doesn't mean that we can't grow to where we have the faith that we need. Amen. You and I are on a course where we are building our faith. And guess what? We build it as we recognize I'm not my strength. If I keep searching for something within myself, everybody in the world is saying, search, look within yourself. The answer is within yourself. Now, there's some ways that that's true. You know, client-centered psychology, that's, that's got some good points and everything. And the fact is, sometimes God has implanted truth in us that we just need to discover for ourselves. But here's what I'm talking about. The authority that it takes to live a godly spiritual life in this world that is fallen and overcome by sin comes from Him alone. 
He is our strength. What's the irreducible minimum? He is our strength. Our strength is who He is. He's the Messiah of God who came to save and who came to correct. And Jesus is going to come back and correct this world. But He has come to correct evil in you and me before the time. This world is on its way when Jesus comes in judgment. But you and I, because we have chosen to follow Him, we've invited Him to come and judge us now. Lord Jesus, show me my sin. Lord Jesus, help me correct it. Help me to follow you. But the thing is, if we want to come after Him, we're going to have to deny ourselves. We're going to have to take up our cross and follow Him. Because in this world, you cannot avoid that. We don't want to suffer. We want to stay on the mountaintop. And we lack faith. Nos falta faith. Let me read to you from 2 Timothy. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now let me just say to you, here's another verse I don't like. At least part of it I don't like. I'm a Southern Baptist. I believe in eternal security. I believe that not because I'm a Southern Baptist. There was a certain point in my life I believed it because I was a Southern Baptist. I searched the scripture. I studied the scripture. I asked God, help me understand. And I came out believing in eternal security because I believe that is what the Bible teaches. Salvation is because of God's grace. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by His mercy, he saves us. And yet there are still some verses that make me uncomfortable. I want you to look at this verse again in your notes. 2 Timothy, it's a trustworthy statement. If we die with him, we will also live with him. What is that saying? If you suffer for Jesus, he's going to lift you up. If we're brought down in some way serving Jesus, he's going to lift us up. Even if we die for our faith. Now this could be referring to the fact that we died to our to ourself when we first trusted him. That's what baptism is a picture of. It's how when we trusted Jesus, we died to ourselves, and he's going to resurrect us. Those, both of those things are true. Even if you die, regardless of what happens to you between here and your death, no matter how you die, Jesus is going to raise you up if you're a Christian. Another great place for an amen. Amen. Thank you. But listen to what it says next. If we endure, we, also, we will also reign with him. Praise the Lord. How many of you have endured through some sort of struggle? Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful news. Then we come to this. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, I don't think that probably anybody in this building has been brought to a point where they've been told, deny Jesus Christ as Lord. Deny that Jesus is God's son. And I've never done anything like that. And I know that you probably thought you read about some of these Christians. I mean, we have literally seen weeks ago, what, 24 Christians lined up? Did you, did, it, did you stop and think about the fact that each one of those people on their knees had been faced with the decision, deny Christ and live, hold on to Christ and die? There are Christians dying for their faith today. Will it come to America? You know what? There's people already living in America who want it to. And I'll say to you, I have struggled. I wish that I could say, I would never deny Jesus. I would never do this or that. I don't know what I'd do. I've done some things I thought I'd never do. Is it okay to admit that? Can anybody not relate to that? There have been some times that I was weak when I just wanted to be strong. And there have been times that I've done things that I thought, oh Lord, you, you must be so ashamed of me. And I think that what this is talking about, 
Did he just say, I think? I can't tell you absolutely I know everything that this means, but I think this is what this is talking about. If we deny him, he's got to pull back. <laughs> does God ever say to Christian, okay, you're on your own with this one? Yeah, I think he does. Yeah, you, you want to go the wrong way. He says, okay, go that way, but come back. Okay? The Bible over and over tells us how God is willing to receive us back. And I don't think, I know, this is something I absolutely know. I know it's not talking about saving and loss, saving and loss, saving and loss. There are some denominations that teach that that can happen. That's not biblical. But I do know that this happens. Here's a Christian, obey, disobey, obey, disobey, obey, disobey. And I know some Christians personally who I believe that God took them home because they had chosen a life of disobedience. But then there's some others that seem to have chosen a life of disobedience, and I'm wondering why is God not doing something? You know what? I don't understand everything about that. But here's what I understand. Here's what I understand. Whatever he means by denying him and him denying us, it goes in perfect agreement with what comes next. Let me get back on the right verse. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, what's the next phrase? He remains faithful. He remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. What does my salvation depend on? Jesus. Jesus. Everybody join me in saying thank you, Lord. Thank, thank you, Lord. Lord. Have I ever been faithless? Have you ever been faithless? Yeah. See, Luke is giving us a sequence of events that explains what our strength and weakness is. Our strength is him. Our weakness is we don't want to suffer. We want the mountaintops to go on and on, and we sometimes lack faith. Is that not true of every single one of us in here? It's true of every single one of us in here. It's actually true of the apostles. He was talking face to face with them. But here's, here's the key. Here's the key. And this is what I don't get some guys preaching today. The fact is, the only way that we can make it when we are frail human beings who don't want to suffer, who want the mountaintops to go on and on and they won't, and sometimes lack faith, here is the one thing that we've got to remember. The answer is the cross. La respuesta es la cruz. I want you to look at verse 44. Does it not sound like Jesus is getting really serious here? Let these words sink into your ears. Let these words sink into your ears. For the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of man. This is why he came. What, in other Gospels, what do we know about this experience that started off this passage? We know that, that Peter steps up and says, you're the, the Christ of God. And there are some in the church who have taken that account in another Gospel because Jesus goes on and says, okay, your name is going to be P Peter from now on. Petros means a little, little stone. And he says, and upon this rock, Petra, huge boulder, foundation stone, cornerstone, upon this rock. What's the rock? What Peter had just said. Who Jesus is. There is no other rock but who Jesus is. Amen. Peter wasn't the rock on which the church was built. In fact, Luke doesn't even mention that. Peter was illustrating the same weakness that we have because in the very next words of the other gospel, Peter's coming, Jesus is saying, I've got to go die. And Peter says, don't even talk like that. And what does Jesus say in those tender, loving words? Get me out of me, Satan! And they want to say Peter is the foundation of the church? Come on, people! Here's the truth. Our strength is who He is. Our weakness is we don't want to suffer. We want the mountaintops to continue and we lack faith. But guess what? Here's what we've got to remember. Let this sink into our ears. Jesus came for the very purpose of the cross. The answer is the cross and we must remember the cross. Pastor, you get a little repetitive. Jesus was repetitive because we forget. Recuerde la cruz. 
We want to think about the miracles. We want to think about the healings. We want to think about the multiplication of the fish. But we don't want to think about the cross. But did Jesus come for any of those other things? Yeah, that was part of what he came for. But he came for the cross. Jesus, in fact, says, this was the purpose for which I came into the world. And if we follow him, we will go where he goes. So following him will take us to a cross. Let me read to you from 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ has come... This, is, by the way, are the words of the man that other people want to say is the foundation of the church. He makes it very clear what the foundation of the church is. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. I want you to circle or underline or highlight two words. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves. Arm yourselves. Arm yourselves. With what? With the same purpose. What purpose? To suffer in the flesh. Let me just tell you, church, this is not what gets pastors on TV. This is what we're to do. We are to arm ourselves. We don't want to suffer, but Peter says, arm yourself with the understanding that if I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to suffer. It is my purpose to suffer for Jesus. It is my purpose to suffer for Jesus. That's what Peter is saying right here. Peter says, arm yourselves with this same purpose. And then I want to end with verse 45. But they did not understand this statement. It was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. When it says they, they, it was concealed from them, is that saying that God concealed it? I've heard that preached. I don't think it was. I think it's still Luke telling us about the human condition. And here's how I want to put it in your notes. Write this down. We never get it. <laughs> we never get it. Nunca lo entendemos until we go through it. Hasta que no pasemos por ello. Okay, now listen, I don't want to bind anybody up. I, I just pray God's blessing on you that the next trial you go through, you will go through it with perfect faith. And I have watched some of you go through tremendous trials, and at least what I've seen, it has shown tremendous faith. But I'm just going to be painfully honest with you. When I go through something that is really scary to me, my faith wavers sometimes. My faith wavers sometimes. I want you to write down three words real quick. I'm going to wrap it up. I really am. But I want you to write down three wor words real quick. Do you remember on the internet when you used to have to write www every time? Aren't you glad they fixed that so you don't have to do that anymore? www. You can't even say that, but I'm going to say it today. I want you to write down three W's. The first one, each of them, in fact, is a substitution for the word suffer. The Bible says that you're going to suffer. We don't want to suffer, but you're going to suffer. And I want to just say to you, the first word is work. Is work suffering? Go back to Adam. When sin came into the world, what did he say? Was the curse work? No, we were made for work. We need to work. Work is a good thing. We're forgetting that as a nation. Work is a good thing. Why are there people who have their needs being met by someone else and they're still not happy because we gain our sense of worth from our work? Work is not the curse. He said that you'll work in the sweat of your brow. It's going to be hard. I believe that one of the things about heaven is we're going to be able to accomplish wonderful things without the stress and strain that we deal with now. We're going to work in heaven. That's absolutely something that's taught in Scripture. But we're not going to work with the sweat and strain. But because work takes sweat and strain now, sometimes we're afraid of it. But what do we do? What do we do? How many of you are going to work tomorrow? Why are you doing it? Go ahead, be carnal about it. What is it, John? Money. Money. We're going to go to work because we're going to get a paycheck. We're going to get the things that we need to supply the needs of our family. 
The Bible does not teach that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money. If you start thinking that money is your strength, you are going to go down. God is our strength. Jesus is our strength. But work and providing for the needs of our family is not an evil thing. But the person who is not willing to go through the suffering that is involved with work, the Bible says shouldn't eat. If you don't work, what's the rest of it? You don't eat. That's what the Bible says. That's not what we say anymore. But the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. Why do some people not want to work? Because it's hard. You got to get up early in the morning. It gets monotonous. I, I get bored. The Bible says we need to take whatever work God has given us and see, assign a purpose to it, assign the purpose that we will do it as unto the Lord. And we need to find purpose in our work to glorify God in everything that we do. But what happens when we work and we don't get the results we want? We worry. Write that word down. We worry. Now, what does the Bible say about worry? Don't do it. Go to God. Go to God. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. What's prayer and supplication? Go unto God. Now, what does worry cause us to do? Sometimes it, tries, it causes us to try to work around in our own flesh. Instead of going back to God, we try to figure it out ourselves. And sometimes we try to do things that are not godly, that are not according to Scripture. I want you to put down another word. Wait. Wait. Sometimes we have to do the work that God has called us to do in obedience to His Word. When we worry about the outcomes, we go to Him, and then we wait on Him. To work. I want, I want you to think about somebody. Who's, who's the patriarch? The first guy that we called a patriarch in the Old Testament. Remember when we talked about the patriarchs in Genesis? Who was the first patriarch? Abraham. Abraham, Abraham was promised something by God. He said, through your seed, I'm going to bless the whole world. And you know what? In order for Abraham to have seed, there was work to be done. And Abraham was ready. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? The fact is, God told man and woman from the very beginning to multiply. And Abraham was told, multiply, your seed is going to be a blessing. And he did the work that God had assigned in order for that to happen. What, what happened though? No results. And he began to worry. And he began to even challenge God. You said I'd have a seed. You said you were going to bless the world. And so he went back. Actually, Sarah went back, Sarai went back, and she came up with an alternative plan. And through worry, there was a new work that was not consistent with God's plan. They were not willing to suffer through the waiting on God. You know what? We're called to be obedient to God even when we don't get the results that we want. When, when we don't see the results that we want, there is nothing wrong with going back and examining what we've done and see if we need to.